Now moving towards the clinical features of hypernatremia. The first feature is sometimes children may have sign and symptoms of dehydration. The usual sign and symptom of dehydration which you have read previously. Now moving towards the clinical features of hypernatremia. The first feature is sometimes children may have sign and symptoms of dehydration. The usual sign and symptom of dehydration which you have read previously. Now the signs and symptoms of dehydration if they appear, if present, they are usually mild in nature and they tend to appear late. In fact, hypernatremic dehydration is very problematic because uh, by the time child comes to medical attention, already there is severe intracellular dehydration which has happened. Let us try to understand why is it so. Let me form a diagram here. There are, let us consider three compartments here, right. First we will form ECF. This is your inside the cell that will be ICF, right. ECF is of two types. It can be either blood or it can be the intercellular fluid, the fluid which is present inside the cells, right? And there is water which is present inside the cell, right? Now try to think if the serum sodium concentration here increases in the blood. So what will happen? If it increases in the blood, usually we find that the amount will also increase in the intercellular fluid. Sodium is more outside compared to inside but there is a delicate balance. If this balance is disturbed and hypernatremia happens that is more sodium outside the cell, there will be a net movement of water outside the cell into the ECF. So what it will produce? In patients of hypernatremia, there is a net movement of water outside the cell. This leads to two things. First of all, it leads to cellular dehydration, which is not a good thing to happen. And secondly, because there is net movement of water happening outside the cell, the blood volume will be restored. So there will be no hypotension despite dehydration happening in the patient. So they will come to attention late. Secondly, because the intercellular fluid volume is better, it is, it is restored. So the usual sign and symptoms of dehydration, for example, skin pinch test, they, they will be normal. Patient is having dehydration, the cells are losing water. But the signs of dehydration will be minimal or absent. This is not a good thing because the child will continue to have the cells are dying of absence of water and the patient clinically is not presenting with symptoms. And so they will come to attention late. The signs of dehydration may be present but they are late in presentation and that is why hypernatremia is such a dangerous type of dehydration. So, signs and symptoms of dehydration, if they present, they may not be present in all individuals, but if they present, they are mild and appear later. In fact, Nelson gives a very important thing that when you check for the skin in these patients, skin pinch test may be normal, but you will find that there is a doughy feel of the skin, especially when you feel it in the abdominal region. So, abdominal skin gives a doughy feel. What is a doughy feel? Just like a, you know, freshly prepared uh, floor, you add water into it and you make a dough out of it. When you press it, a small impression like inside goes in and there is a very specific consistency of that. Similar consistency you will find in the skin when you check in the abdominal region of these children. So this can be a potential MCQ point for your exam. So first is features of signs and symptoms of dehydration and why they are important and their pathophysiology. Second, you will find that there are CNS features in these individuals. The CNS features initially are non-specific. They include irritability, weakness, lethargy and restlessness. 
Infants will have a high pitched cry and hyperpnea and nausea will be there, increased thirst will be there, fever is often present which may or may not be related to the primary pathology. And then hypernatremia can be associated with two problems, one is hyperglycemia and second is hypocalcemia which is mild in nature. Nelson also accepts the reason why hyperglycemia and hypocalcemia happen, it is not clear. Severe hypernatremia can lead to CNS hemorrhage, right? And this CNS hemorrhage can be life-threatening. Why CNS hemorrhage will happen? The mechanism is just what I told you. Whenever there will be rise in the uh, serum sodium level, water from inside the neuron will move outside into the blood and CSF. So what will happen? Now two things will happen. The amount of blood and CSF will suddenly increase. At the same time, the neurons will shrink. Unka to dehydration ho the cells are shrinking. So when neurons will shrink, they will move away from their skull attachments to the inside. And this sudden change, they are contracting, their vessels are dilating. This will produce a scenario where there is stretching and tearing of meninges and their vessels, CNS blood vessels, leading to the development of either subdural hemorrhage or subarachnoid hemorrhage or intraparenchymal hemorrhage. So, in patients of severe sudden onset hypernatremia, you will have this manifestation coming which can be life threatening in the patient. It is explained similar to what I just told you for the dehydration mechanism. Now, Nelson also says that even though central pontine myelinolysis is classically associated with correction of hyponatremia, both central and extra pontine myelinolysis have been reported to occur in children with hypernatremia as well. So, they can happen as a rare complication. Now, moving further, there will be thrombotic complications happening sometimes. You will have, they are seen in severe hypernatremia associated with dehydration. It includes stroke, there may be dural sinus thrombosis, there may be peripheral thrombosis and there may be RVT that is renal vein thrombosis.